right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, this may be one of the final times of the school year that we have a live event for classrooms across North America. Many classrooms are already out for the summer, and then a few more will go until just about the end of June, and then everybody will be on summer vacation. And of course, we'll be right back here in September hosting live events with scientists, adventurers, explorers, and conservationists from all over the world. Now, this week is a special week. It is World Pollinator Week. We celebrate those amazing pollinators, the bees, the bats, the birds, and the other animals that help pollinate our plants, bringing us those beautiful flowers that we love to see, that great fruit and other things that we love to eat. So this is really important that we celebrate our pollinators this week. And I can't think of any better person to have joining us than Melanie Kirby. So she is an artist, a conservationist, a journalist, an educator, and a researcher. She's an explorer with the National Geographic Society. She's worked on several commercial queen bee rearing operations in places like the Big Island of Hawaii, in Central Florida, in the Upper Peninsula uh, of Michigan. Her research involves breeding and habitat enhancement for bees. So what's important to her is the value and the power of storytelling. So connecting humanity from the past to the future uh, and between the inner and outer cosmos. Her field experiences inspired her to return to academia to help amplify farmers' voices and to quantify their field observations. So I'm going to go to New Mexico where we have Melanie standing by. Hey, Hi. Melanie, how are you? <laughs> good. It's going good. How are you all? Good, good. Melanie, we have a great group of classrooms from across North America joining us. We're so excited to get into what you are up to and to celebrate the pollinators today. Yes, this is actually a really special week. It's National Pollinator Week, so June 19th through the 25th for this year. And it's a great time to really learn more about all your varying pollinator species. I'm actually hanging out um, at the Institute of American Indian Arts campus with a few of my students. Some are hanging onto the camera. Others are getting suited up and will come join me as we um, pull out some bees for you to look at. And um, yeah, we're here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So this is a high desert, what we call inner mountain southwestern region. It can be quite arid, meaning it doesn't get a lot of water, but we actually um, have the Rocky Mountains come through our region. And so we get a lot of um, snow on the peaks. And when that melts, that brings a lot of the water down that we can use to water our gardens and our fields. And that helps to provide for a lot of habitat and biodiversity. All right, excellent. Well, Melanie, a huge shout out to your team who's helping you out today. We're so thrilled that they can be there uh, behind the scenes. We are going to have a kahoot a little bit later, so the classrooms are going to get to compete against each other uh, and see who knows the most about our bee friends. Uh, and then we'll have some Q&A action. But for now, I think, uh, yeah, take us right into it. it take us into your uh, your world, the world of the bees, and, and that important job they're doing for us. Sure. So I'm not sure if everybody knows this, but there's over 20,000 different kinds of bee species across the globe. Some of them are what we call um, solitary bees, and they may live by themselves. They like to either live in the ground or sometimes we'll, we'll um, dig a little hole in a tree trunk or in wood um, or in rocks sometimes as well. And then there are others that are eusocial, kind of like bumblebees, where the queen will live by herself through the winter, but then come springtime, she'll get out and build a little colony. And then you have social insects, which our um, honeybees are a part of, and so are ants, and so they live actually in a big hive family. And so I'm gonna take you in today. Um, one of my students, Ellen, who's actually managing the camera, um, is a recent graduate of our school. And so she's she's got a degree in um, some of the film art stuff. And so she actually is holding the camera, but she did like the smoker. So I wanted to give her thanks for that. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and put on my gear. So you may have seen beekeepers wear a veil. This is my hat and veil. And I usually keep it pretty simple because I like to be able to wash my gear often. Um, I don't get stung as often as you think, but sometimes it does happen because they are wild little um, pollinator relatives. So beekeepers do tend to wear lighter colors and that's because if you think about it, they live in the dark. So they're inside their hive in here. This is actually called a top bar hive and it's a horizontal hive system. 
So sometimes you may have seen others that are like this that are stacked boxes. This is called a Langstroth vertical system. And so we add boxes when they grow. And in this one, actually, they build lengthwise. So they actually build horizontal. Um, but beekeepers will wear lighter colors because since the bees live in the dark inside their homes, when they come out, everything is really bright. And so dark things stick out, hence them being able to find flowers, right? And bees actually see in UV light, so they can actually see different patterns on the flowers than we do. But anyway, I'm suited up here. Some of you may have seen the bee movie, which didn't necessarily show beekeepers in the best way possible. We do use some smoke, but not as much as they did in that movie. I just use a very little bit because the bees communicate with pheromones, which are like perfumes. And so when I use a little bit of smoke, it can help, it can help to calm them down and it'll actually, they'll move out of the way of the smoke so that then I can handle their combs without getting stung or without squishing as many um, as I would not like to. I don't want to squish any, but if possible. So let me go ahead and get my hive tool and I'm just making sure my veil is over my collar. Sometimes I tie it on tight, but we set up a canopy up here today because we have a light sprinkle. Most times we visit bees when they're out working and it's nice and sunny and it is nice and sunny here today. It's uh, nine o'clock in the morning, mountain time. I have a sheet of insulation on top and that just adds a little bit of extra protection. And then you have all these different bars here and these bars actually have honeycomb on them. So we're gonna open them up. Their entrance is on this side and there's another one right over here. So I just make sure to stand where I'm not gonna block them. And this is a box that um, one of our faculty members, one of our teachers made for us a few years ago. Thank you. So here is empty comb. This one's actually really light. There's no honey in it yet. Once it gets really heavy, I have to be careful not to lay it because it'll break off. But this one's really light so I can move it. But you can see up close that cool honeycomb pattern. And that's wax. The wax they actually make by eating a lot of nectar. And then they, they crank up their, their body temperature and they sweat. And the, what comes out is wax. And then they use that to build their home. Here we go. This hive is growing really nicely. They were a new hive family that we just started this spring. So this one now has some bees and babies on there. And you can see they just attach their wax to the top. The wax actually has a really high melting point, meaning that even though they can get really warm in their hive, they, the wax won't melt. So you have to imagine how hot they have to crank up their temperature just to sweat it out and make it soft enough to build. But this is pretty cool right here. This is a boy bee right here. That's a drone. He's bigger than his sisters. He actually, and I'll pick him up here real quick. He does not have a stinger, so he cannot sting, but he looks a little bit bigger and sounds louder than they do. He's got really big eyes. Put him back on the comb there if he'll get on there. And then all these are his sisters. And they're actually putting nectar. You can see some of the glisten in there. They're depositing the nectar. So bees will collect several things. And actually this one right here, you can see she has pollen on her legs, pollen on her pollen baskets, we call it, on her little legs. You can see the yellow there. So bees will forage for nectar, which is their carbohydrate, and pollen, which is their protein. And together that makes a complete diet for them. And in order for them to store it, they have to have somewhere to put it. So that's why they build the wax. But the wax is like their central nervous system. It's their spinal column. It's their memory board. It's their pantry. It's their nursery. It's their dance floor. It's um, where they communicate with one another. And so it's really cool to see how they have the nectar in here. And then this darker part right here is actually, these are new babies. Maybe we'll see a new baby being born today. Let me look at another frame for us too. I'm going to put this one back and funny enough in this hive just to show you when they were brand new we actually had a little tiny this is a cat waterer for your pets and we had put what we call tea some bt in here which was um, uh, 
herbal tea, non-caffeinated, for the bees just to get them started with some sugar, but they slurped it all down. So they don't need that anymore. They're building quite nicely. I'll move these out of the way. So when I work through the hive, I try to be really careful, but you can see I'm not wearing any gloves. And my first couple years of beekeeping, I wore gloves all the time. But now I don't necessarily have to. They're pretty gentle. This one's getting real heavy with honey. You can see how it's getting darker because it's getting more filled. And there's a few more boys on here, the brothers. So the worker bees actually go through different jobs. Once they're born, they start off as an egg and we'll see if we can get some close up of some um, eggs and larva. Oh yeah, this one you can see there's a lot of babies on this one. But yeah, they, once they're born, they actually go through different jobs. They'll start off as a little housekeeper bee. Um, and that means they help to keep their hive clean for their family. And they'll do that for a few days. And then they're, um, they have special glands in their mouth area called hypopharyngeal glands. Those will actually start to kick in and then they can start to produce royal jelly. And royal jelly, they eat a lot of pollen in order to make the royal jelly, but it's actually creamy looking like yogurt. It even tastes like yogurt. It's not sweet at all, but it's really packed full of vitamins. It's kind of like mother's milk. And that's the first food that all of the baby bees get. Try and see if we can find the queen. I'm moving carefully here because this is a more open comb. So she might be on this one laying eggs. And let's see if we have some good, there is some larva in there. I think I can lay this one down. I don't know, can you see in there, Ellen? Can you see the larva in there? It's a little hard to see. Look right here. You might see a small glisten in there and that's the larva floating on the jelly. But we'll see. Might find another frame that's a little bit easier to see. Um, funny enough, look at this. This looks like a little mud dauber. This looks like some other little um, insect has built a nest on top of the, uh, the bar here. They're not gonna hurt the bees, so I'll just leave them. But it's kind of cool, look in there. So a lot of these insects actually will live next to each other. Just kind of funny. <laughs> so here's a solitary little wasp guy who's built a nest next to the social bees. So a couple of weeks ago, I actually added some empty bars in here to help them sort of what I call accordion out so they could expand. The difference between this type of hive and the stackable box kind is that this one just has the top bar. That's how it got its name. And the other ones have three more pieces of wood that make a frame. And that actually makes um, the comb really sturdy. So this one I just have to be a little bit more careful with. But this you can see, oh, let's see. Somebody just was born out of there. And we'll see if another one's going to be born. There's about 1,500 born in a day and 1,500 that pass away each day. The queen can lay about 1,500. And as I mentioned, the first job that the new bees will have is um, housekeeper. And then once their hyperpharyngeal glands kick in, they become what we call a nurse bee. And then they can start to feed the other developing larva in the hive. So let's see, we'll move in here a little bit quicker now, just in case we can find the queen. That way you all can see how she looks. So because this um, comb doesn't have the frame around it, I'm using a special hive tool. This is called my hive tool and I've got my smoker and then um, I'll use it to just kind of make sure that the comb is detached from the sides of the wall of the hive so that I can pull it up carefully and not break the comb. If it does break then I usually have to tie it back on with string um, and when we go to harvest honey, we actually will cut it. Oh, look, here's someone tr about to be born right there. You see him? Mm -hmm. Oh, there comes some antennae. So they're sniffing around. Their antennae is like their sniffer, their nose. <laughs> That's how they pick up on pheromones. And actually, usually when they try and come to, they'll stick their tongue out and then their sister's will feed them. That's called trophallaxis. But she's using her mandibles to cut out so that she can 
basically emerge and then she'll join all her sisters and just start helping with everything. A couple next to her are eating something, <laughs> which is really cool. Here, I'm going to lay this one flat in case we can see her emerge. But I'll keep looking for the queen, so I'm going to put this one right here. There she is. Come on out. So it's her birthday. Oh, there's our queen. So you can see how much longer she is. And she's actually looking for more places to lay eggs. So the worker bee will take about 15 and a half days from egg to an emerged um, queen. And then she'll have to go on her mating flights and then she can lay eggs but her daughters will take um 21 days to go from egg to an emerged adult and the boys take 24 days they take longer because they're bigger but they all start off with royal jelly the first few days of their life and then their diet switches to what we call bee bread which is honey and pollen mixed but for the queen her diet stays royal jelly that's what makes her queen so there's only one of her in the whole hive She's the only mama in here laying all these eggs. And the bees will actually help to corral her. She usually has what they call a retinue. You can see them following right around her, lined up next to her. And she's emitting pheromones and perfumes too. And so they help to spread that around. And that way everybody in the hive knows that they have a mom. If they don't smell her, then that's when they'll try and rear a new queen. But they have to find the right age larva to do that. Because if, they're, if the larva is already being fed bee bread, then it won't be able to turn into a queen properly. And the way the queen knows whether to lay girl bees or boy bees is that she can feel with her tail um, the size of the cell. So each little cell has a certain dimension. And if it's smaller, she'll know to put a fertilized egg. That way it's her daughter's. And then if it's a bigger cell, then she'll just put in unfertilized eggs and that's the drone. Those are her sons. And so actually, if we have a colony that we really like, we try to nurture them to rear more daughters, but we also nurture them to rear more drones because they're the ones who are gonna carry all the hive's memories um, and their genetics will get spread around. So the queen will only mate during one small period of her life and that has to last her the whole lifetime. And so she can live, um, depending on the environment, if the environment's clean and healthy and good forage and she mated successfully, she can actually survive for years. But if there's problems, she might only last a few months. And in that case, then the bees will try to either rear a new one or sometimes the beekeeper will have to add one. So she has a mark on her back. This year's color is red. There's an international color code. Let's see if I can, there we go. And they're really actually, they're quite soft. They don't really like to be pet, but you can tell I don't, I don't pet their tails because that's where the stinger is. <laughs> But there's international color code and this year's color is red and it's a non-toxic, no odor, water-based little um, paint pen that we use. And that way we can keep track of her age. And that way we'll know um, when we can rear daughters off of her. We actually try and um, select for, for bees that do really good in our environment. So just like seeds and seed collection with flowers and plants, we try and find the ones that work really well here. Yeah. So there she is, and you can see the difference in the comb. I'll put them side by side. This, all the comb starts off really light and white because it's fresh, but then the more the bees walk on it, and every time the queen lays an egg in there, the, the bee will actually go through its own metamorphosis. So it actually is an egg, a larva, then a pupa, and when it's actually capped over, it's in its process of uh, metamorphosis, and they spin a little cocoon in there. And so the pupil casings remain, and that also makes it a little bit darker too. But both of these, once we melt them down, will yield a nice yellow wax. And then we can use that wax to make lip balms or candles. This queen is so cute because she likes staying right here in the middle. But you can see how long her body is. And let me see too. I'm going to move. Let's just so we can do a comparison here. So there's the boy bee. You can see he's got a really big thorax and big eyes. And his sisters have smaller eyes. 
And then the mom has a really long abdomen. And so that's how we can tell the difference between the three. Yeah. And this hive is actually, they're, they're pretty filled up. I, you know, we started at the back and now we're moving forward. And so each one of these bars is filled up. And so once they get really heavy with honey, we will then start to um, harvest some of that honey. And you can see they're even filling in nectar where there's becoming more spaces. So hopefully we'll be doing a, a harvest soon. There's a lot of boys on this one too. And oh, here we go. This is great to see. Oh, look at the pollen legs. That's cool. You can see the different colors of pollen. But look at these um, cells right here. So you see how these are flat. That's how I know those are going to be girls. And these big bubbly ones right here, those are going to be the boys. Those are going to be the drones. So that's how I can tell the difference of um, who's going to be who. And also that's how the queen can tell what size to lay. You can see how these cells right here are bigger. And so she'll lay an unfertilized egg in there. Whereas these smaller ones, she'll lay the fertilized. And then they put the nectar up top. And then once that gets cured, you'll see they actually start to cap. There's little pollen legs again. You can see they put wax on top and that's so it doesn't spill out. They also build their um, honeycomb at a really cool angle so that it doesn't drip out either. Melanie, Hi, this is, Joe. I was just gonna pop in and say, this is absolutely amazing. I can't believe we got to see a bee being born. We got yeah. to see the males and the females. We found the queen. This is a pretty darn cool way to spend some time uh, during pollinator week. Yeah, here we'll do one more thing, which is I'm just going to stick my finger here in this honey. This one's cured. So you can see how it's oozing out. Oh, yeah. And then I'm going to taste it. <laughs> oh, you guys wouldn't like it. You shouldn't try it. Probably it's not. Delicious. Yeah. yeah. It's delicious. <laughs> oh, Melanie, absolutely amazing. I I think it's time, though, that we, we get into the Q&A action and we sure. play a little game with the students, too. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. So I'm going to load up. Uh, the Kahoot for the students, it is ready to go. I will also share uh, the pin number here on the screen so that everybody can see it. So if you go to kahoot.it, it's going to ask you for a pin number, and I have it right there on the screen, 806-0626. Now, if you are um, have something at your desk that you can use, that's great. You can join with like a laptop or a tablet. If you don't, then maybe your teacher can pop this up at the front of the classroom and you can shout out your answers to him or her. Um, if you're at home, there's a little handy QR code up there and you can scan that with like a phone or a tablet and it will bring you right in. So we'll give just a couple moments here uh, for some students and some classes to join us. And to those tuning in via YouTube, of course, you can join the Kahoot. You can also start sending your questions in via the live chat so that we're ready with some questions when the time comes. And in fact, uh, Melanie, while we wait for students to join the Kahoot, we've got a question here from a grade four class. Sure. And they're wondering, are there more female bees and why? Good observation. There are more female bees. And they're more female bees because they're the worker bees. They're the ones who collect all the nectar, all the pollen. They're the ones who sweat out the wax. They're the ones who take care of the babies. Um, and they're the ones who actually fan to help dehydrate the nectar um, into uh, honey. So um, there are a lot more females. The males actually don't do any of the collection of the resources, but they are necessary for new queens to mate. And so their main goal is to get big and strong so that then when it's mating season, they can go and fly. And actually the bees will mate in the air. Um, and a queen can mate with anywhere from five to more than 20 drones. Um, and so once those drones have made it though, they actually, that's their, that's their last call of duty and they pass on. Okay. <laughs> so we still have students joining. So I'm going to give another few seconds, but a grade six student, uh, Smyra would like to know which type of hive is better, a stack or a bar? That is a really good question. You know, um, Different hive designs work well in different environments. Um, where we are at in the higher elevations in northern New Mexico, I actually tend to prefer the stackable hives, the, the, the sorry, the vertical Langstroth boxes. However, I can use these long ones, which are really good for teaching demonstration, and I just have to extra air holes. You saw I had said there was another entrance over here too. 
And that's just so they get a good enough airflow. We get a pretty good winter here, so it gets cold. So during the cold season, of course, there's no flowers, so bees aren't collecting anything. They actually go into what's called cluster, and they will rotate around and eat their honey reserves and shiver, and that's how they keep warm. And so um, with a stackable box, the, the vertical one, it's kind of like a tree trunk. They can move up and down to get to their honey. In a horizontal system, sometimes they're so, it's so cold out that they move really slow. And so sometimes they don't get to the honey in the back. So we make sure to um, put all their honey right near them before it gets too cold. That way they have enough to get through winter. But it really depends on where you live. This type of hive design, the um, top bar, is a really um, what I want to call low tech design, meaning you don't have to necessarily have a lot of power tools to make it. So it works really good in places where they may not have um, a lot of uh, electricity or power tools, um, but it does require more maintenance because the bees can build their comb crooked. So I always have to go in and it's kind of like setting the bones. I have to sometimes do surgery and help fix things so that then things are lined up. And there's a very specific math. They like what they call um, what we call bee space. So it has to be a certain um, spacing for them to like it. And then in the framed version, there's actually, um, you know, those are made more with power tools and those uh, you can buy from factories and bee supply places. So some people like those because then they're standardized and they can have a bunch of them. But really it's up to the bees. If they don't like a, a specific home, they're not gonna stay. I've seen bees make a home um, underneath someone's grill, inside a tractor, under an awning, in an attic, also in a little water meter box, in a log, in an old tire. I mean, bees are pretty resourceful. As long as it provides good um, uh, protection from the elements, then they may consider it. But in order for us to manage them well, um, we like to try and choose equipment that um, that we can respectfully look at them and, and make sure that um, they have what they need. All right. Well, I think we are ready for some Kahoot and then we will go right into our Q&A action. So here we go. There are, I believe I have five questions today, a little bit of true and false, a little bit of multiple choice, 20 seconds for each question. The faster you get your correct answer in, the more points you are going to receive. So here we go. We're going to count in three, two, one. And here comes our first question. Which is an example of a pollinator? Bees, birds, bats, or all of the above? So which is an example of a pollinator? Bees, birds, bats, or all of the above? We've got a couple more seconds to get your answers in. All right, so I see lots of varying answers, but a lot of students went with all of the above, which is absolutely correct. Bees, birds like hummingbirds, bats, they can all great examples of pollinators who come and visit those flowers for that delicious nectar and then get dusted with a little bit of pollen and pass it on to the next flower that they visit. The dynamic boa is in first place and we are going on to another question here, true and false. Bees can live in groups, but they can also be solitary, which means they live alone. True or false, bees can live in groups, but they can also be solitary, meaning they're living alone. True or false. All right, good job crew, we know that is true. We normally think of bees living in those big hives in those communities, being social, but we saw that example today of uh, that little solitary wasp that was living uh, on the top of that hive. Agent Meerkat takes top spots. Let's go to our next question. Another multiple choice. How many different types of bee species are there? Was it 200 plus, 500 plus, 2000 plus, or 20,000 plus different types of bees? 200, 500, 2000, or 20,000 plus different types of bees. All right, most of the students went with 20,000 plus. That is absolutely true and absolutely amazing. I think we forget how outnumbered we are, Melanie, by the insects. Okay, let's see. The silly lemur is in first place. Wow, we got a lot of lemurs today. Silly lemur, proud lemur, and nimble lemur taking that first, second, and third spot at the moment. 
True and false. Bees see the same colors on flowers that we do. Is that true? Or is that false? Bees see the same colors on flowers that we do. True or false? Got a couple more seconds to get your answer in. All right. Awesome work, students. That is false. They can see more of the color spectrum uh, than we can, particularly that ultraviolet, that UV light. And they can see different markings on the flowers that we can't see without help. We just can't see that with our naked eyes. The silly lemur is holding on strong. We've got one more question, a true and false to decide everything. Bees sweat out the wax they use to build their combs. Is that true or is that false? Things get nice and warm. The bees sweat out wax that they then use to build their combs. We've got five more seconds to get an answer in and then we will see what our podium looks like. Oh, good job, crew. Most of us went with true. So what does that mean? Let's take a look here. In third place, we have the agent meerkat. In second place, we have the silly lemur and holding down that top spot in the spotlight, the proud lemur. All right. Good job, Cruz. Thank you so much for playing along with us today. I'm going to stop that screen share. There we go. And uh, we will bring me back in like this. There we go. And now we're going to get into a little Q&A action. So here we go. If you're on YouTube, use that side chat bar, send us in some more questions, but let's start with some of our camera classes. So joining us all the way from Edmonton, Alberta, we have some first and second graders hanging out with us. Let me bring them in here. Hi, Room 12. How are you doing this morning? All right. Good to see you. Who has a question for Melanie about our bees, our pollinator friends? <laughs> We'll let your teacher pick someone for us. Uh, what is to what does the what does the bee uh the queen bee do? Okay, so Melanie, can you can you tell us a little bit more about what the queen bee does? Sure. So her main job is to lay eggs. So she's the one who helps to keep the hive going, but then all of her daughters help to feed all those babies. So she's just an egg laying machine, really. Um, and that's why they feed her a lot of royal jelly because it's a lot of nutrition. And then that way she can lay eggs um, for more sisters to be born. Because I mentioned she can lay about 1,500 eggs a day. That's 1,500 eggs a day. And so during wow. the summer, during the active season, they will live about four to six weeks. Um, and so there's always a need to replenish the population. During the winter, they can live a little bit longer because they're not out flying and foraging. But um, during the summer, that's when she's mainly laying eggs because there's always 1,500 that are coming into the world each day and 1,500 that are going out. Okay, thank you, Edmonton. We're gonna jump to another classroom now and we are going to visit, let's see. Miss Kaufman's crew is joining us in Ontario. Looks like there's some third graders. Let's get them front and center. Hey, third graders, how are we doing today? Oh, third and fourth graders. There they are. Don't forget to get that mic for us. Yeah, there we go. There we go. How do queen bees get laid? Like born. How are the, How is the queen bee born compared to the other female bees? That's a really good question. Um, so you saw how that was flat when I said, oh, look, these are the worker bees, the daughters, and then the bubbled ones are the drone, right? So if they're going to rear a queen bee, she actually, her cocoon is really long and it usually hangs down off the bottom of the comb. It looks like a peanut in its shell. Have you ever seen peanuts that are still in their shell and you have to crack them open? They're really long and they're kind of bumpy on the outside. That's what a queen bee, um, queen cell looks like. And then she will be born out of that. All right, very cool. Thanks third and fourth graders. Let's see if we have something here on YouTube and then we'll grab some more camera classes. Okay, here we go. Let's see. 
So Max would like to know, do bees get sick and is there any way to help them? That is a most excellent question. Um, they can get sick. Yes, indeed. Um, sometimes they get sick from different viruses, like they can get their version of a cold um, or there's other diseases that might get spread around from um, bee to bee. Sometimes um, funguses that they come into contact with out in the wild um, can also cause a problem in the hive. But what can really weaken their immune system is when there's really um, poor habitat for them. So there's a lot of things that folks can do to help support pollinators. And that's what this week is all about is to raise awareness um, for folks to plant more pollinator friendly flowers and stuff that blooms in each season, the stuff that blooms in spring and summer and maybe early fall. Usually if you're in a place that's cold, you won't have flowers in the winter, but some places that are warmer might be able to even have blooms that go throughout other parts of the year. And to avoid using any toxic sprays such as pesticides, um, because what hurts the, the problem bugs also can hurt good bugs too. Um, and then fungicides, sometimes people will spray those around and that can actually alter their protein in the pollen. And so can herbicides. Herbicides, even though we call them weeds, those might be another bee's honey. So all the plants serve a purpose and sometimes we don't want them in certain places, which there are different ways that we can remove them without using those toxic sprays. But yeah, folks are very much encouraged to plant more flowers for all the pollinators, for the bees, the butterflies, the bats, the birds, and everybody in between, even the moths. All right. We have, let's see, Miss Bennett's crew, grade six is in Brampton hanging out with us. Let me see if I can get them up here. There's their camera. All right. Hey, grade sixes, how you doing? Hi. 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 Oh, we're going to get a little feedback because there's two uh, devices going, but that's okay. If you ask your question really quickly, uh, we can get it in without too much feedback. Does each ball of bees have the different species? Okay. So I think you were asking if each, like each hive or group of bees, is it just one species or are there different ones in there? Was that what you were asking? Yeah? Okay. Oh, cool. That's a really good question. Yeah, in this hive family, they're just one family. But because their mom mated with several different drones, then they actually have, sometimes they have different dads. So within the hive, they all have the same mom, but they will be super sisters, which have the same dad and subsisters, meaning same mom, but different dads. And that's why some of them look different colors too, because they get a little bit of the color markings from the different genetics inside. And that's the way bees actually naturally prevent the, um, the problem of inbreeding. So they want to make sure that their genetic pool stays really nice and diverse. And that way the queens, actually new queens that are ready to mate, they will actually fly, fly really far away to go and mate because they don't want to mate with any of their brothers. And then that way they keep the genetic pool nice and diverse. And that way they don't have any inbreeding problems, which if they are inbred, then they can get sick more often or may have some other issues. All right. Thank you for that great question. Uh, fourth and fifth graders hanging out with us. They are in Ontario. You, there we go. Hey, fourth and fifth graders. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. We've got a question for us. Hi. Hi. Hello. 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 Do you guys have a question? Can you see us? I can't see you, but that's okay. We can hear you. Okay. Great. Okay. 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 Uh, the camera. Yeah, can, 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 no, the, the camera is not on. No. Oh, <laughs> don't worry about the don't worry about the the camera, guys. Go ahead if you have a question. Same. All right, Lily, do your question. Uh, yeah. Uh, what's the difference between the pollinator and the bee? Yeah. That's actually a really good question because I'm gonna quote the book that some of you may have read everybody does poop, including bees. So they don't actually pee like we do, but um, some same as birds, they don't actually pee like we do, but 
their um, excrement all comes out of one spot in the back. And so, yeah, they have a digestive tract just like we do. And after they eat a lot of honey and pollens, um, then they will sometimes have to defecate. And I will tell you, it looks a little bit like mustard streaks, but it doesn't smell the same as mustard. <laughs> All right. Um, I think I, I think I hear that sprinkling in the background. You're getting a little bit it of... It is. Yeah, we put a little canopy up. We got a little, a little mist blowing in. Very cool. Glad we got the canopy up. Yes. Uh, okay, back to YouTube because we have a few questions coming in here. One is, um, let's see, Kathy would really like to know, um, oh, oh, sorry, that's not the question I was looking for. Where did it go? Um, okay, so the this is from Miss Green's class. And in a, a hive, like the one that you were showing us, how many bees would we expect to be living there? That's a really good question. Um, it's hard to count every single one of them because they're moving in and out. But I will say this, during the warm season when there's flowers, they will expand in population. So when we started this hive, um, I think it was uh, late May when we started them. Or actually, this one we started, I think, uh, middle of May. They were just right here. And you guys saw, now they're all the way back here. So there's probably over 80,000 bees in here right now. That's wow. a guess. If we think that there's about 1,500 cells on each side and there's at least 20 of these, there's 3,000 per comb, 3,000 times 20 is um, 60,000. Yeah, so they're in about between 60 and 80,000. Wow, amazing. Uh, another question here, Lila would like to know, do they ever run out of royal jelly? That's a good question. Well, the... Um, the nurse bees will only produce it for a little bit of time. And then when they kind of age out of that, then they become guard bees up at the front. So they get to start getting used to the different smells of, that their sisters are bringing in. And then they become foragers. And then they actually go out and collect pollen and nectar and sometimes water as well. They'll also collect propolis, which is a resin on trees and shrubs. And they use that to seal cracks in their hive. Um, and so basically they'll they'll quit producing royal jelly at that time. During the winter or the cold months, when they're actually not building in population, they go into kind of a slow-mo and they just rotate around and eat their honey reserves. During that time, nobody's making royal jelly. So they usually will only make royal jelly when they're starting to, to build up in population through the spring and summer. All right. Mrs. Black, second and third graders are joining us virtually and they're wondering, if bees have color vision and if there's something they prefer on a flower, like a color over another one? That's a really good question. You know, I've heard that birds really like reds, but I think for bees, um, they like a variety. They really like aromatic flowers. You know, if you think about it, our plant relatives are communicating with the bees. The bees are using their antennae to smell. And so there's a reason these flowers look so pretty and also smell so good. And that's how they're encouraging the bees to and the other pollinators to come and visit. Um, in terms of their preference, I'm not sure. I think it kind of depends on what the season is. You know, sometimes you'll see different flowers blooming at different times of the year, which also means that their honey will taste different at different times of the year. Um, but they do like to have flowers throughout the warm season. So that's why we like to encourage folks to plant some things that bloom in the spring and some stuff that blooms in the summer and late summer and early fall. Okay. Well, Melanie, this has been such an awesome morning. This has been such a great way to really start pollinator week. I mean, I knew we were gonna get to see the bees, but I did not know that we dive that deep into their world. We'd see so <laughs> much today. Uh, I know the classrooms have questions galore. What would you, any place you'd suggest they could go this week to learn a little bit more uh, and do a little research? Yeah, I would definitely, if you go online, look up um, your own community and see like pollinator, uh, pollinator week events and see what might be going on in your community. It's a great time to go and um, buy seeds or actually to um, 
buy some flower starts from your local nurseries. Um, try and avoid some of the, the bigger box stores just because some of their plants may be treated with um, pesticides, but you can always ask um, and see if they have some, some healthier forage there. And a lot of places will have little tags, but you, one uh, really cool website to check out is called Xerxes.org and that's X-E-Z, sorry, <laughs> X-E-R, C-E-X dot org. Xerxes. It's kind of a weird way to spell it. I believe that's it. I could be wrong, but do a quick search. And they actually are um, a nonprofit organization and they do a lot with pollinators um, and they usually schedule events all across the country during this week. Okay. Very cool. Well, I want to start out. C-E-S. That's it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I want to start out with a huge shout out to all of our students who joined us today and the students who will catch the recording this afternoon who couldn't make it this morning. It's always great to see you. It's always great to hear your questions and play Kahoot with you. In fact, we still have some classrooms kicking around backstage, so I'm going to bring them in. If you guys want to get really loud, a big goodbye and thank you uh, to Melanie okay. and her team who joined us today. Thank you. For the very, very cool. Uh, Melanie, thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to see you. Um, you're doing awesome work. Uh, actually, and just a quick shout out too, if you want to see Melanie as well, she is featured in an episode of the series on Apple TV called Jane. Uh, and so that's really cool. You can learn a little bit episode more about Pauline three. there, episode three. And then <laughs> you can see Melanie at the end talking a little bit about the work that she is doing. Melanie and your team, thank you so much. Keep up the great work. Thanks for taking us into the world of our pollinator friends today. Yeah, thank you. Anytime. All Have right. Fun. Have a great week, everybody. And we are going to sign off for today. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>